So to begin tonight, I am going to use a prayer that's different than the collect. And, uh, and because I think it may have something to do a little bit with the lessons, which is going to be a little bit of a challenge tonight. Uh, so this is a prayer for cities, but don't be fooled by the title. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in your word, you have given us a vision of that holy city to which the nations of the world bring their glory. Behold and visit, we pray, the cities of the earth. Renew the ties of mutual regard, which form our civic life. Send us honest and able leaders. Enable us to eliminate poverty, prejudice, and oppression, that peace may prevail with righteousness and justice with order, and that men and women from different cultures and with differing talents may find with one another the fulfillment of their humanity through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 I tell you what, every time I look at prayers in the Book of Common Prayer, I see justice written all over the place. It's just Where did that prayer come from? It's from the Book of Common Prayer. Wow. And it's on page 825, in case you want to take note of it. Yes. And BCP is quite a resource. It really is, yes. I opened up all my stuff, but there we go. So let's do this uh, following other folks' pattern. Let's start with, um, we'll read the collect, the Old Testament. We'll read all the lessons and then see what we can put, pull apart and put together as we go through this. Um, so uh, who would like to read the collect for today? It's one of my favorites. I'm sure it's I'm sure it's Father David's favorite too. Hmm. Very Anglican. I'll read it if you like. Please do. Yes, okay. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. 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 Thank you. And who would you like to invite to read the um, Old Testament lesson? It's very short. Do I get that choice? You get to invite somebody, yes. Oh, oh, yes. Okay. It's Malachi, isn't it? Yes. Uh, um, Anne, would you like to? Yes, sir. I'll be glad to. Thank you. See, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with the healing in its wings. Okay, then we have Very Psalm much. 90. Who are you going to invite? Invite someone to read Psalm 98. Yes, ma'am. I would like to yeah. invite Henry to do so. Thank you very much, Anne. Yes, sir. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. With his right hand and his holy arm, he has won for himself the victory. The Lord has made known his victory. His righteousness has he openly shown in the sight of the nations. He remembered his mercy and faithfulness to the house of Israel. And all the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Shout with joy to the Lord, all you land. Lift up your voice, rejoice and sing. Sing to the Lord with a harp, with a harp and the voice of song. 
with the trumpets and the sound of the horn, shout with joy before the King, the Lord. Let the sea make a noise and all that is in it, the lands and those who dwell therein. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills ring out with the joy before the Lord when he comes to judge the earth. In righteousness shall be judged the world and the peoples with equity. Thank you. Who would you like to invite to read Thessalonians? Oh, um, I would like to um, invite Maria. Okay, thank you. Now we command you, beloved, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from believe, believers who are living in idleness and not according to the tradition that they received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. We are not idle when we were with you, and we do not eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we work night and day so that we may not Excuse me, so that we might not burden any of you. This is not because we do not have that right, but in order to give you an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this command. Anyone willing to work should not eat. Excuse me, anyone unwilling to work should not eat. For we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Brothers and sisters, do not be weary in doing what is right. Thank you, Maria. Who would you like to invite to read the gospel? I invite Laurie. Thank you. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said. As for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, teacher, when will this be and what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, beware that you are not led astray for many will come in my name and say, I am he. And the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified. For these things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places, famines and plagues, and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish, but by your endurance, you will gain your soul. Thanks, thank you all of you. So here's, here's a kind of a, this, this is an odd group of readings. It, they just seem like, what are they trying to say together? And some of them seem really um, distressing to say the least. So I'm going to give us a challenge to think about how the theme, one of the themes, there are two or three themes woven into these lessons, but one of the theme is about justice. Two of the commentators that I read talked and spoke, talked about, wrote about a connection with Martin Luther King and the civil rights movements. And with that, so that's one thread is about 
uh, justice and the challenge related to justice. Another thread is about the end times, about how things may end and and what are we to do in preparation or how are people behaving in preparation for these end times? And to put a, perspe a different perspective on end times, I'd like to uh, refer to a comment made by Phyllis Tickle, who was a, a spiritual writer in the 90s, in the early 80s, 90s, you know, that period of time. In fact, I got to hear her talk at St. David's uh, when I was there in the early 2000s. And one of the things that she has said in many places is that we are in a time of great upheaval, that the, the church, as in Christianity or religion in general, goes through major upheavals every 500 years. So remembering 500 years ago was the Reformation. And in our time, we're seeing people fall away from the church. And we see things just breaking apart in our society. So this may be a time of upheaval. Um, it certainly looks like it to me. So I would like you all to think about and see the question that to put before us is, where do you see these themes being addressed particularly in any one of these readings or a combination of these readings? I don't know. <laughs> tough question, it. isn't it? It's a tough question. Mm -hmm. Well, Malachi, I'll just go, just kind of go through Malachi for a moment. Uh, in the previous chapter, chapters of Malachi, they're talking about the leaders of the nation of Judah and how corrupt they were and how um, they were abusing the poor, the widow, the orphan, the foreigner. They were not following the rules about taking care of the vulnerable and those on the margins. And so therefore, there went this, we had this statement of the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the arrogant and evildoers will be stubble. They will be taken care of. They will be replaced, but they're going away. I see Henry's hand up. Do you want to follow up with that or say something else? Uh, yes, um, uh, Deacon Vic, uh, I would. Um, uh, you know, just to answer your rhetorical question, what do I see, um, uh, you know, as a theme in these readings? And certainly I see justice and certainly I see end times, but maybe the, the theme that marries the two of them is endurance. And that is uh, about the last sentence in uh, uh, the gospel reading. And also, um, I couldn't help but think of um, a compare uh, uh, a relatively similar passage uh, to the gospel in late in Matthew when Jesus talks about the end times he talks about wars and rumors of wars mm -hmm. and um, uh, and you know those of uh, us uh, uh, Philip Caputo uh, wrote a memoir about Vietnam called a rumor of war which came out in 1978. And uh, he was uh, uh, among the first Marines deployed in 1965. And, uh, oh, yeah. Mm. I'm so you're, you're seeing that theme of the end times. and Yeah, and, and, and for Christians to endure. You know, you mentioned Canada, you mentioned King, 
Uh, one of my favorite comments of his is that the wheel of justice turns, but sometimes very slowly. I've said enough. That's great. Thank you very much, Henry. I can pick up a little bit. I've mostly thought of the psalm tonight as uh, this marvelous poem about the, the joys of being um, related to or in the concern of the, the Lord, the, the, the God of the, of the Jews. Uh, but at the very last, and all these wonderful metaphors, same to the Lord, the let the sea make a noise and all that is in it and the lands, let the rivers clap their hands. Great metaphor. Very last, uh, last verse, in righteousness shall he judge the world and the peoples with equity, justice and the end of the world or the final mm -hmm. judgment. One of the commentators made a, a remarked that, and it may have been a commentary on this song, is that it expresses the judgment, God's judgment at the end. You know, we think of that as the end times as being a very positive experience. It's about being um, facing God and having God welcome you and and bring you in and say, I'm so glad you're here. And, you know, that he's going to deal with the peoples with equity, with, with uh, far more equity than we deal with people, for sure. And that, mm -hmm. um, you know, that things will be, be better uh, through his judgment. What do you all think about that? Thinking of judgment as a positive thing rather than a negative thing or maybe you don't see that well, mostly it's sold to us as something to be fearful of and we better we better do right here and here and now because uh, there's a, a judgment coming but uh, it is also a positive it is as you mentioned a positive thing but all all sadness and all evilness and all inequity will be swept away mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that yeah that 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 judgment may be um, about the, the changes that, that equity would come into the world, uh, that everybody, we will be able to get along with each other and work, become a beloved community, you know, that we might, that might actually enable to become, be able to happen. Yeah. That's correct. It might happen. It would, it would take a miracle, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, anybody want to come in? Um, Paul has some interesting things uh, in terms of, you know, in Paul's letters, the end times or the coming of Jesus is a real significant topic. It's kind of like be ready because he's coming. Jesus is going at hand. It's going to happen any time now. And um, but Paul is in this letter to the Thessalonians is saying, yeah, but you you guys, you people need to be not just ready. You need to do the work that you're called to do. You need to do the work of the Lord and you, you, you can't be idle. There are apparently two schools of thought about uh, who are these people that are being idle. And one school of thought is that these are the believers, the di disciples in the community who um, are saying, well, Jesus has been here, he's come and gone. You know, there's no point in doing anything. So forget it. I'm going, you know, I'm not going to do that work. I'm not going to do the work for the community. I'm not going to do it. Another school of thought is this is about religious leaders who come into the community from somewhere else and they expect to be taken care of 
and have the community feed them and clothe them and provide them with the means to live and so on. And Paul says, you know, when I was there, when we were there, we were working and earning our own bread. We were not being idle in any way. And these should not be idle too. So there are these two schools of thought about who are these idle workers. Lori, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, my <laughs> there's something about this passage that bothers me because I think it's been used these days many times by people who try to put down the poor mm -hmm. for wanting food stamps or some kind of assistance and saying something along the lines of, you know, that you're idle and you don't deserve it or mm -hmm. you don't deserve the bread if you're not working. And a lot of it, I think the, it comes from this it's kind of a reading. Yeah, yeah, that particular verse, anyone unwilling to work should not eat. Yeah, it, yeah that's pretty strong. Be, it is strong and it can be, it has, has been easily mm -hmm. used to justify mm -hmm. not providing for the poor. When all over the Bible and all the, you know, all mm -hmm. parts of, of the books there, they're all talking about God calls us to provide for the poor mm -hmm. and the hungry and the naked and the widows and the orphans and the foreigners, you know. And we are to judge this. them. We right. are to provide and not exactly. judge. And then this one is more judging them and, yeah. you know, their worthiness. I think it's because of the word unwilling. Anyone unwilling to work should not eat. It doesn't say anyone unable to work. That's right. Yeah. Madre Minerva has something to say. Yeah, it was just that's exactly what I was going to say. That what Father David said. It's, there's a difference between unwilling and and uh, unable and other things, right? And I think the other thing that this is a particular letter for a particular community at a particular time, and so mm -hmm. taking those things out of context always gets us into trouble, right? Mm -hmm. So as Deacon Victoria uh, said, there's two lines of thoughts as to who whether it's people who have said. Well, the end of time is tomorrow, so I don't have to work. And you know, I'll just it'll just it'll you know why bother? You know, it's happening, right? Or it's people who have who are following in the tradition of status allows you to be take, to have privileges that people without status don't have. So if these are people who are learned, they're seen as leaders in the community. And then now they're like, oh, okay, so now I'm the person at the top. So now I'm the person that people have to take care of and provide for me. And I no longer have to do what other people do because I now I have a particular role in my community, right? And so I don't have to work. And I either one of those, um, either one of those, uh, whichever one of those things it is, it's causing consternation. It's causing, uh, they call them busybodies, right? Something is not quite right. It's causing tension and disruption in the community. And so they're writing to Paul and say, hey, there are some people who aren't working. What's, regardless of why they weren't working, they're not working. Like, what is our response to that? And so, so Paul, St. Paul responds to that particular situation, right? And so I think that, what are, what what are what ways are people living that is not recognizing the teachings of Christ and actually the teachings that Paul taught them right Paul taught them the teachings of Christ so what what is it that they're not following and how is it that people are not living into what this is, what does it mean to be a new community what does it mean to be a new a new people that recognizes Christ as the savior and that recognizes that that at some point there will be this newness of where all is made right. Henry made a remark about the use of that term, anyone unwilling to work should not eat, that dates back to Jamestown 1607. Mm -hmm. Do you want to expand on that a little bit, Henry? Or how does that 
How is that uh, fitting with our conversation here? Uh, briefly, um, well, uh, the context is um, uh, it goes back to what you just said. Uh, um, no, I'm sorry, what Lori just said, that the phrase makes her uncomfortable. And Lori's absolutely right. And the current, the current events of the day, you hear that. Uh, but there uh, have also been other meanings to it, too. Mm -hmm. And back in 1607, the English colonists all thought they were gentlemen and were not were above manual labor and certainly were above were above farming. So in order to uh, get uh, people uh, to in order for the colony to survive, basically they adopted uh, if you don't work you don't eat. Mm. But Lori spot on with her comment uh, on current events today. So I want to split uh, shift us over a little bit. Uh, in terms of talking about times of upheaval and in the gospel reading. So one thing to put into perspective in terms of context is that this temple that, that everybody's admiring is the temple that Herod had rebuilt. And not just Herod, the one in charge, in ruling then, but probably family before that, because it took 80 years to build, rebuild the temple. And it was built bigger and better and more beautiful with more woodwork and jewels and things. You know, it was a nice, shiny, wonderful, beautiful place at that time. And, and Jesus is saying, you see all of this? it's going to go away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it was in around 70 AD, so about 40 years later, that it was destroyed, that the temple was destroyed. And so one of the things that one commentator, uh, well, let me finish my thought here. So what I think Jesus is saying is that there's going to be an upheaval, that things are going to be torn apart, leadership, rule, whoever's in charge, all these things, that changed in around 70 AD, when that's when the diaspora for the Jews started. They had to get dispersed, and Christians had to move out too. There was just this total upheaval at that time and but and so there are all these terrible things happening but jesus kept it did also say that by your endurance you will gain your soul so if you can hang in there jesus i'm with you god is with you that um you know don't don't be led astray our lord is with you that there there are going to be terrible things happening but you keep your faith, keep the faith and keep on moving. Um, so any responses to that felt thought or Mike? Well, just a, a tiny bit of history. I'm thinking about the arrival of the Romans to um, aid one faction against another in about 70 BC. And then the destruction of Herod's temple 100, roughly 140 years later mm -hmm. by um, a different set of Romans. Uh, the, um, so, as so often happens, the, the people that they invite in got their, uh, their occupied the entire tent, so to speak. Um, but I'm, I'm troubled by the fact that this story uh, reflects Jesus seeing into the future, I presume. Uh, and I'm, I'm always a little hesitant to say that people can actually do that. Uh, that's all I'm saying is, so, uh, but the future is, it's very hard to predict the future in, 
predictions are very hard, particularly about the future. It is, it is reputed that uh, uh, Yogi Berra said, but it was probably said by someone else. You know, um, of course, we, it's helpful to remember that the Gospels were written pretty much around the time of the destruction of the temple. Okay. If you think about that. So, you know, it's one of those things that hindsight is better than, than right 2020. You take a look at this. And so there may have been a conversation where Jesus is saying, you can't depend on this beauty and all this. You know, this is not it. I, you, we can make up all kinds of ideas of what he might have really actually said. But this is what people remembered him saying. And putting it in the context of about the time that the gospel is written, I think is an interesting way to look at that. Um, you know, and he does say here, so make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. And that's the place where he's saying, I am with you. The Holy Spirit is with you. So, you know, just hang, and it's like, trust, have faith, you will not be alone, and um, even if you're betrayed <laughs> by your parents, and some will put you to death, you are not, you know, you are being taken care of, you're being with, we're with you. That's a very modern way of saying that. I recognize. <laughs> well, it's hard for me to to um, think of these words such as uh, "before this all occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you." Hard sitting here today in the twenty first century, with uh, a couple of hundred years of uh, the Christian religion having a, a sort of privileged position, to think that this could happen. Um, so there again this that puts us into context mike we see here in the united states of america and in a european centric world we see that the christianity is the dominant religion and that there's no persecution of christianity but if you go to other places in the world where I uh, remember hearing the bishop, Anglican Bishop of Pakistan about 10, 12 years, 15 years ago, he was here in Austin and he talked about how the, pop, the Christian population of Pakistan had gone from a number in double digits to about 3% and that they suffer persecution. It's very common. And, um, and it's a very dangerous place to be Christian. And there are loads of other parts of the world where that's true. So, you know, in a sense, I tend to think of it as our Eurocentrism really puts blinders on us about how, about the world because we only see it this way, which is very, you know, it's totally understandable. This is our world. This is what we live. But um, that, that level of, you know, that level of acceptance and persecution changes from one area of the world to another. Well, that's certainly true. Try being a, a Christian in Iran. Right. Um, well, yeah, North, in, in our own North country. Korea. We're having issues with with uh, with the Jews and being persecuted, persecuted in our countries now. People are very anti. A lot of people are very anti-Semitic and starting to attack people who are Jewish. So it's not so out there. It's it's around us now. We just happen to be on a different side. Yeah. 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 Uh, anybody else have a comment or thought? Well, 
I, I guess this uh, gospel, uh, which is alarming, certainly, ties in with with uh, something. <laughs> I'm sure I know what. Somewhere in there. Yes, Father David. I just wonder how Christians of the next generation who had seen persecution and all kinds of hardships would handle the last sentence of this uh, part of the gospel. Well, the last two sentences, not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. I can see the last sentence as making sense spiritually, mm -hmm. but not the penultimate one. Yeah. Not a, head, not a hair of your head will perish. Yeah, that does candle. seem kind of um, impossible, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Henry well. has something to say. Henry. Thank you, uh, Deacon Vic. Um, uh, the only thing I was going to point out, and you know, uh, Deacon Vic, thank you for reminding us of our Eurocentric uh, perspective, but uh, Christianity in Europe is not what it was a generation or two either. And here it's not persecution, it's, uh, I think it's apathy uh, or maybe something else. Um, so um, uh, there are, uh, uh, I suppose, active as well as passive enemies to our faith. You know, I started, uh, I've started reading uh, the book written by Canon Stephanie Spellers. It's called The Church Cracked Open. And, uh, and so I'm just starting in this, but where she's starting with it is even from it saying exact, talking about exactly what you're talking about, Henry, is that over the last several decades, people have fallen away from the church mm -hmm. and they not that they, there's they're not engaged with it they're not challenged they're not interested they're it's just like they have there's it's just not there and um and and that's one of the comments that she made that supports that we're in a time of christianity where the church is cracked open that things and so it's a map, it's an upheaval. So how are we going to respond to that upheaval? We as individuals, we as a community, we as the church, larger church, Christianity as a whole. So, um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a real challenge. Mike, you have something to say. And Madre Minerva, I heard you. I heard you speak quick. <laughs> um, I, you know, I was so swept away by your profound comments, Deacon, that I've forgotten what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, well, you know, you can leave your hand up and let Mother Minerva talk and it might come back to you. Okay. <laughs> Um, I just think I want to, I would just, this, this gospel in particular, I mean, I think you mentioned this Deacon Victoria, that it's, uh, and, all gospels are written after, right? This is in retrospect. This isn't right. people, even though these stories, I, the other thing I think what's important is that even though it was written later, those stories started being shared very early on. Yes. Immediately people were telling people from other, you know, sharing these stories coming. Have you heard about this Jesus? Did, did you see that he, he did this miracle? Did you see what he did? So I don't think that we need to think about, oh, well, it's, it, they're so far apart. They're so far away that we really don't know what happened because people were passing on stories we meet right away. Right. So there's, so I think that's one thing. But the other thing to think about is when it was written, I mean, this was in the middle. It, it's People talk about how maybe they could see, especially if they were written, um, that means that they were not living in Jerusalem, right? If you could, if you were alive, and you, you were not in Jerusalem because Jerusalem was surrounded. It was terrible. People were basically starved. Um, they kind of surrounded it. And then they were, and then, and then when, they couldn't leave 
and there was no water. I mean, it just, it was horrible, horrible conditions. So you, you hear that in some of these gospels, you hear, or women will be, well, women would be, will be sad that they had children, you know, people, because they just don't have, they couldn't feed their children, like all these atrocities that were happening as they were surrounded and, and Jerusalem was just left basically to people to just die in there. And then they went in there and they just destroyed whatever was left, right? So there, so there's, there's some, some, some. I, you know, if you could see, if you're far away, but you're on a hill and you could see the smoke, and you could hear, and you can, and you know what's happening in there, right? It's just terrible, terrible things. And I think part of what Jesus is saying to people at this point is, you have put your faith on a, on a system. You have put your faith on the system that has collaborated with the oppressor it's collaborated with the empire and nothing's when you put your faith on the empire <laughs> you can't but lose right because they're not interested in your salvation they're not interested in your well-being they're not interested in your in your thriving and so you're being you're you're there's nothing going to be left and all of all of those who have kind of bought into that system there's going to be terrible suffering. And so I think he's challenging people is don't look to what looks so solid and so um, beautiful. Well, not just beautiful, but also just like strength, right? There's a sense mm -hmm. of strength yeah. and power. Yeah. Um, I was very fortunate. I, I got to go and um, you stand and the, and what's left of the original wall. I mean, these, these things are huge stones. I mean, huge, huge stones. So they just look impenetrable. They look like nothing could touch them, right? And so I just think it's the reminder of that not putting our trust in temporal and things that shall pass and putting our faith in a God that is faithful and will be there and, um, and, 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 and doing the work that we're called to do so that we can start living in this, in this world that will all will be made right. But in the meantime, we can um, start acting and living as if it is right. Mm -hmm. And well, that thank makes, you. That Madre makes more Mitchell. sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And thank you for reminding us that, you know, it wasn't that long ago. Just think about 40 years ago, I was 34 years old. I can tell you stories about Martin Luther King, about uh, James Baldwin, about Malcolm X. I can tell you stories of the racist teachers and science teacher who was put it, you know, teaching the terrible science about differences in races and stuff because I was there. And if I can, but I can also tell the stories that parents and aunts and uncles told about World War II, about the 40s and so on. So these stories, all those truths come through. So I'm, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because even though it's after the time, there's a lot of truth. There's also a lot of, you know, there's a lot of memory fuzz as well, but that's okay. <laughs> you know, it's, it's uh, pretty good. I, 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 you know, and maybe it's, maybe one thing is, is reflection, right? Is reflection. Right. Yes. And exactly. things that, I mean, think about how you think about the experience you had 20 years ago and you thought I was alone. I was being punished. It was terrible. And then you're like, oh, but that woman who came and shared this insight turned my life around, right? Or that I, right. that was the beginning of the, the light coming through the darkness. And you're like, oh, that's where God was, right? But mm -hmm. if you, it's in, in the moment, you don't see where God is. Sometimes it's in reflection where you see God was there. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Henry, I'm going to give you a chance to say something finally. <sighs> Yeah, but you're on mute. 
There we go. You know, uh, what Mother Minerva just said uh, was so wonderful, and it reminds us of what we sometimes talk about, how lucky we are to have three distinguished theologians in our presence. Mm -hmm. um, Deacon Vic, Father David, and Mother Minerva. And what Mother Minerva just did, um, uh, she linked the gospel with Jesus's wonderful uh, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render unto God the things that are God. And that is wonderful. And also, um, uh, Deacon Vic, uh, you nailed uh, the story angle. Uh, I have not been a very happy camper today, uh, in part because of the politics. Uh, but I found myself remembering a family story. Uh, and Father David, you will like this. One of my ancestors was with Wolf on the Plains of Abraham in 1759. In Canada. Canada. Yes. Uh, wounded. And it took him six months to get back to his home. And he found his wife and kids were gone. And it took him more months before they were reunited. And so I was just thinking about a family story that's now 263 years old about endurance. And I figure that if those people could handle it, by golly, and by gum, I can handle this stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good point. Thank you so much, yeah. Henry. How yes, about you, Mike? Please. Well, thanks. First thing, I forget it. Uh, this is an example of what we're doing right now. Is a good example of why um, religion is important because I just uh, got a little inspiration from what Henry said. The other thing I, I remembered is is the speed with which. Even, even before newspapers and telephones and the internet, uh, the story of Jesus began to circulate. And, and uh, Paul was out there with the earliest Christian documents, his letters, within uh, 30 years of the, the death of Jesus. So things get good news, news, Good news, bad news too, I guess. Travels pretty fast. Um, yeah. I, I, one, one last thing is that uh, it certainly seems to me that there is an indifference to uh, religion among, and there are people on this call tonight whose children never darken a church door. Mm. Um, don't know exactly what to make about that. I, I'm, I'm waiting for the next sermon from Deacon Victoria, where she explains the church cracked open. <laughs> it's going to come. It's going to come. <laughs> yes. One thing, one thing um, I, I want to add to as Madre Minerva was talking about the starvation and everything around the time of the destruction. Uh, it was like one of those, oh, yeah, duh, you know, in the book of Acts. Paul's always talking. He's out there fundraising. He's gone. He's on. He's not just out there preaching. He's fundraising to get money to send back to Jerusalem so that the people can get food and goods and whatever they need. And so uh, I think it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, uh, you know, it's kind of like being on a campaign. You're out there fundraising, but he's on a campaign for Jesus and and the gospel. Yeah, I mean, Very often what often when he says, "I am so," I, I I pray for Thanksgiving for the love you have shared, you have shown your the saints. A lot of times, what that means, literally, it means that they have given money. So that he can take it back to the uh, Jerusalem saints, and when, we, like I said last mm -hmm. Sunday, the saints were the you know where where people who were following the way, where these were Christians, um, and so so he's out into these very wealthy communities that uh, are starting to turn, be, create Christian communities, and asking them 
to put money to send up, send back to Jerusalem. And so think about if, if, if we had, you know, think of, think of our Christian communities in a very wealthy country like the United States, if we did what Paul was doing, which is where are the, where are those Christian communities in the rest of our, whether it's in the, in the rest of our state or in the rest of our city or in the rest of our, you know, country or, um, even going international, right? But that there is this sense that we are one body and when one suffers, we all suffer. And so how do we share of our of our wealth to these smaller or more poor communities that are also Christian? And so, um, yeah, it's. I think that we have, I, I, I feel like we have often lost that sense of connection and seeing us ourselves really as one body because I mean sometimes we don't even consider some of our fellow Christians Christians I mean we don't even think of them as humans much less Christians mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and um I think this this theme of justice that is that is so interwoven in throughout all the books of the Bible that um, it, it's tragic to me that if I preach about justice on a Sunday morning and then someone turns around and thinks that I, and says and makes a comment, not that it, this has not happened to my knowledge, this has not happened, but I'm just kind of going a little stereotype generalization that then someone turns around and says, she's preaching politics and doesn't see that justice is a core element of our faith. That seems yeah. to be a, a phrase that I've been using a lot lately in our Sunday school and in our uh, conversations about these core elements of our faith, forgiveness, justice, caring for one another. And that's what all of these lessons are addressing. And sometimes it seems like they're really not addressing it, but they really are. And we just have to, you know, see where these puzzle pieces fit. Ooh. Good point, yes. So, um, Henry, you have something. Um. Uh, yes. Um, so uh, basically, if I understand you, um, Mother uh, Deacon Vic, and I am on your side and in your camp, um, people might think that um, uh, the choice uh, before us is uh, uh, preaching politics or devil take the hindmost. <laughs> you know, I preach the gospel. I preach justice mercy, walking humbly with our God, to, pro to quote Micah. That's, and I, that's, and that's I what we're called to do. Yeah, and I think you're on solid ground. And I think some folks are not on such solid ground. You know, everybody does the best they can. You know, whether, you know, though so, and everybody addresses. Now, not that I agree with them. Um, I always like to hope that the intentions are, are honorable. Um, even when all the evidence says the other way. Well, here's the thing. I think this is the other thing. I think we, we, we don't have to say, well, I don't think everything is allowed <laughs> from the pulpit. And I think one of the things that Jesus says is do not put your trust on any system that's been made by humanity. And right. so that goes to me when I feel like, you know, this party A is so much better than party B. And I have to, whenever I start thinking that, it's not very often because I'm not a big fan of, either, of most political parties. Um, when I start leaning a little bit on that direction, I have to remind myself, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of Christ. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. I'm not, you know, first and foremost, that's what I have to be allegiance to. And so no human 
elected official <laughs> can trump Christ. No matter how attractive, how charismatic, how well spoken, how you know, easy on the eye, whatever, all of those things can lead us to idolatry and not to be true to the God that is faithful, right? That doesn't mean that elected officials are not faithful people. It doesn't mean that they're not doing their best. It doesn't mean, but it's like for me, right? Like nobody follows Minerva or Mother Minerva. <laughs> I'm not, that, that would be wrong, right? We follow Christ. There's no human who is, um, who can, who can, who can distract who, 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 who whom we should follow without first saying and asking, am I following Christ or am I distracted? Mm -hmm. That's, uh... And I think, and so, so to say what, what I mean by that, Victoria, is I do think that it's, it's not good for any preacher or lay, lay, lay you know, whatever that, whether there's lay or clergy preachers, who go up and say, now we need to support our brother so and so or our sister so and so. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because they are, you know, Christ own or whatever, right? I mean, I just think that that uh, and from any side, from any political spectrum, from any political party, when we start aligning ourselves uh, and, and not, um, and not being true to the to the God that is true to us, um, I think that that's that's just not good for that's not good for our for our. For yeah, our no, that's when you're stepping outside, you're yes. stepping into the world, into the empire, and yes. the powers and the principalities. <laughs> you know, yeah, but sure. when we're talking about um, justice for people that are marginalized, justice for people that are. Uh, striving and, and suffering that's that's a whole different thing yeah Lori, you and then i'm on one okay. i'm going to make one last comment okay. and we're going to end with a prayer okay i just wanted to say this is the reason why at saint john's we have renamed one of our teams <laughs> it is our racial justice team is now the racial justice and so racial and social justice team mm. Very good. Yeah, that's very exciting. Mm -hmm. And uh, several of you, yeah. So um, just a little bit of a history lesson. Remember I kept saying every 500 years, there's an upheaval. Well, the first upheaval counts as the Roman Empire and the, you know, the destruction of the, the temple. That's the first one in terms of Christianity. Mm -hmm. The next upheaval was in around actually the year was in the fifth century when the Visigoths and all those those barbarians came in and and uh, took over Rome and the the Christian the Christian world at that time entered into the Middle Ages which was a very dark time and that takes us to one five hundred one thousand is the Middle Ages and then we get the Reformation, which was an upheaval. And now we're here 500 years later, trying to figure out what the heck is going on. So we'll find that out sometime. Maybe when we're in heaven and our, our descendants are, <laughs> have gone through the, the times, the end times. I would like to end us with the collect for tonight. And we were talking about the Bible and how uh, learning about how the Bible talks about justice throughout. So I think this is a good, good entry point into that, this prayer. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. 
Amen. 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 Thank you all. I'm going to stop the recording. Thank you. I think um, Anne Faithful wanted me to hang on for a minute. That's right. She does. Yes, I did, <laughs> sir. Thank you.